this is this title of, of your talk, Recent Advances in Random Matrix Yeah, theory. it's a super huge title, it's not very long title. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, so, uh, it's really a great honor to be here and to visit this beautiful city. And I'm in fact a PhD student, so I'm really far from being a professor. So my name is Zhen Yuliao and I'm a, PhD, a third year PhD student uh, under the supervision of the uh, Professor Romain Gouillet uh, at Central Superac France, uh, so I'm from Paris. And today I'm going to talk about some recent results where we say a, a, an application of random matrix theory to understanding of some kind of uh, machine learning problems and uh, improve uh, this machine learning methods to, to handle large dimensional data. So some motivations, but I'm not sure it's really necessary for for uh, for your machine uh, random matrix experts sitting here. Uh, so we're going to today. We're going to we're really in the big data age, and we are treating. We are trying to handle it. Uh, so both large dimensional and a huge uh, number of data. So in the sense that we are we have the number of data n uh, super large and also their dimensional p uh, their dimensional p large and they are kind of comparable large. Uh, for example, I'm not sure it's working. Yes. Uh, for example, we are we are dealing with large uh, high resolution images and uh, we are treating them with very involved, complicated uh, machine learning systems. For example, the deep neural network. So. Uh, so we really need to, 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 to consider that we have n and p are both large. Uh, and in this uh, large NP regime, we have very counterintuitive phenomena. For example, we have the so-called curse of dimensionality problems. So this is very, I would say, um, basic observations from uh, the machine learning community. And they observe that in, for a high dimensional, for a large dimensional data, uh, the idea of Euclidean distance between two data points uh, when the dimensional is very large, uh, so the difference is very small in the sense that if you have two data from the same distribution, so yeah, you have two observations from the same distribution, or two observations from different distributions, this Euclidean distance is almost the same. So in the sense that it's very counterintuitive in the sense that it's very different from our three-dimensional uh, daily life observations. So we would say in our daily life uh, we have, I don't know, two, for example, two clusters or two, say, uh, cloud of points in 3D and uh, we have idea of that they are close to each other or they are far away from each other by measuring their distance. In the sense that if they are in the same cluster, so in the same uh, cloud points, the distance between this data from this class is should be small. And if we take one data from class one and another data from class two, this distance should be bigger. But uh, for high dimensional problems, people in, in the machine learning community already observe that, well, for large dimensional problem, for large dimensional data, this distance do not really make sense. Or we should kind of say the idea of being close to each other or being far away from each other do not really make sense. Uh, indeed, numerically we say that, we will say in simulation also later, that we approximately uh, living in almost the same distance from each other, will, even we are in the same class or in different class. So, so it's is very the of you being a metric or any metric? Yeah, sorry? Is the feature of any metric or only PBM? Uh, well, in fact, it's generalized to more difficult, but I will only point out the, the, this, this example of Euclidean distance. It is not limited to Euclidean. Uh, and it's something we observed. So, well, this tells us that in, indeed, uh, if we want to handle large dimensional data, it's very different from what we say uh, in our daily life. So. In fact, we were saying that, for example, in the case of uh, kernel spectrum clustering, which is a, I always say, classification method, machinery method, uh, uh, this should not be working because they are, they are invented built on our three-dimensional uh, intuitions. But in fact, this still works. Uh, the problem is that we do not really understand why they work for a high-dimensional data. And uh, we try to figure it out. 
And uh, in this sense, that uh, we need to understand. So first, understand for high-dimensional problem why they work and how they work, and is there any way to improve man, uh, to improve those methods to really uh, adapt to large-dimensional data. Okay, so we want to improve this 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 method, which is made possible by random matrix theory. And from a random matrix theory technical point of view. Uh, the problem in many machine learning uh, methods or algorithms is that so they're often involved with kind of nonlinearity in the sense that I'm talking about, uh, for example, in the case of deep neural networks, we have those called entry wise nonlinear functions. So you apply, you have a matrix and you apply a nonlinear function entry wise to this matrix. So this is kind of stuff where we do not really do in. I would say classical uh, random matrix theory, but maybe I'm wrong. And also, sometimes it's even worse, we get a, some, count, some kind of implicit solution. So we only know that we want to solve an optimization problem. We do not have an explicit solution for that problem. Uh, if we are in the convex case, this means that we, okay, we will have unique uh, optimal solution. It's already not that clear. Uh, we, we know it's a optimization solution, but we don't have its form. And sometimes it's even worse. We have a non-convex case, so we even do not know what we are going to. So it, we, we may have many, I don't know, local minimums or set of points, something like that. So uh, from a random matrix technical point of view, machine learning brings those kind of, I would say, technical difficulties. But maybe it's really a small case for, for you guys. Anyway. Uh, so I'm going to start with the uh, sample cross matrix that everyone talked about again. Um, well, we are going to estimate the current matrix, say, from, a, from n data. No, we're calling data. Uh, and data in the sense that I have a large matrix X, and it, uh, it's just got a, a n data point. So each data point is a p-dimensional vector. So where I would say we have X, I, that are uh, p-dimensional column vector, and we have n of them. Okay. And we're going to use our classical wisdom of uh, maximum likelihood estimator and use a sample current matrix. And uh, uh, so we have this c-hat, and we have a suppression. So in the sense that if we have much, really huge number of uh, data, uh, in the sense that we have n much larger than p, it works. It should be work fine. Okay. But in the, in the large NP region, for example, uh, in particular, if we have N smaller than P, well, it can be problematic in the sense that uh, in, the, uh, in spectral norm, it's not, never going to be the correct estimator, so everyone knows that. Because, uh, because here, it's a, it's a sum of uh, N rank 1 matrix, and uh, so it's uh, at, of rank at most n, but we are trying to estimate something uh, of dimensional p times p, okay? So, of course, if, uh, in the sense that if we have n smaller than p, we will we'll get p minus n zero if n values. Uh, well, we are trying to estimate really, so our right answer is the identity <laughs> matrix. So we are supposed to get uh, a, a huge uh, a huge eigenvalue uh, at uh, uh, the value of one. Okay. Uh, so we are making error because 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 we do not have really sufficient data, or because the objective, uh, I mean the the sample current matrix say here is kind of too large uh, for our problem, for the the end data that we have at hand. So I want to argue that it is typically what happens in, in today with machine learning problems, in particular in, in deep learning or deep neural networks, because we are really trying to fit a super, super large, uh, I would say, prediction or regression model with a, a large number, but not really insufficiently large uh, number of data. So uh, let, me, let me give some number. Uh, typically, we are using some kind of residue network that has been already talked about that has about 60 million uh, parameters. Uh, but we only have about 14 million par uh, number of images. So we have only about 14 million of data to fit this huge model. So we are typically in the, in, in, the, in the scenario that we really do not have uh, that's much. Uh, that's much data. 
so it's very really important to understand what we are doing and how can we improve our estimations for example. And uh, so you will say, okay, uh, if it's not it's not working for deep learning, then uh, will we get in very simple machine learning algorithm. And uh, if we have really really huge number of data, is it uh, can we just go through and use classical statistic uh, wisdoms to handle our problems? Well, it's not that clear because here I plot the equation of Machinkova-Stor law, and we know that. So its eigenvalue it would be uh, between one minus square root of say uh, and uh, one plus square root of say square. And uh, I will take so the number of data n equal to 100 times the dimension of uh, our data uh, our data p. So we have really a large number of data it is 100 times. Okay, and we say that. Uh, in the sense of estimating the eigenvalue, so the true answer again is should be someone uh, something really high peak at one. But uh, machine covariance the law tells us that uh, our estimation is going to be between 0 0.8 and 1.2. So indeed, we are really making an error of in the in the sense of uh, estimating eigenvalue of plus and minus 20% uh, of error, even with the number of data that is 100 times the, the dimension of it. So even in this case, uh, I would say, well, you, you have 100 times your dimension uh, number of data, it's still not really enough to, 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 to have a correct estimation. So most of the time, we're really under the end large MP region is, is the motivation. And now I would love to talk about uh, machine learning stuff. So I will start with the so-called kernel spectrum clustering. So just a reminder. So what are kernel spectrum clustering? <coughs> so we have the n data points, and we want to separate or cluster them into a uh, different class. So uh, indeed, this n data points is follows. They are drawn independently from the several distribution. I would say two or three uh, distribution that are statistically different, and we want to build some similarity matrix S, for example, based on um, I don't know the inner product of each data point or the Euclidean distance, as we already mentioned. Uh, we want to build some similarity matrix S and uh, to extract so the uh, top eigenvectors that contains the structural information or so the class information of my end data. So in this case, we will say that the first quarter uh, the first quarter of the data, for example. So this this x is uh, in, indeed uh, of length n. So it represents the sequence of data. So we we say that in this case, the first quarter may be the class one, and the second quarter is class two, and the remaining half is uh, class three. Right. And uh, what do people do in practice when they have, for example, when they have the the top uh, two eigenvectors? They just uh, uh, extract uh, those values. Uh, for example, they take the, the value of the first eigenvector as the x coordinate and the second as the y coordinate, and they form a two dimensional representation. And in this case, we say clearly so this is eigenvector one and this is eigenvector two. And we say that in this case, we have really tr three class of, uh, I would say, uh, cloud of points or clusters. And it's indeed the straight class that we can say already from those two top eigenvectors. Okay? And, and they use uh, the EM algorithm or k-means to, to do this. So uh, this is uh, the brief introduction of kernel, kernel spectrum clustering stuff. And uh, uh, I would love to talk what happens uh, for high dimensional data. So I'm taking a very, very simple uh, model, data model, uh, that I have only two class, and they, uh, they are indeed uh, Gaussian, Gaussian random variables, uh, but high dimensional. So I have class one and class two, and they are different from, they are statistically different from each other in the sense that uh, they have different means and uh, uh, different covariance. So in this case, uh, if everything works right, 
uh, I would expect my uh, spectrum clustering algorithm to extract or to separate uh, these two data that are from this two distribution. Uh, if the difference of this mu and this difference of e that are large enough, okay? So if they are kind of statistically different from each other, I would expect uh, my uh, spectrum clustering stuff to work. And it can show by easy Neiman Pearson test that, uh, well, I really need all this information, so this difference in information statistical information to be large enough so that uh, I can separate these two Gaussian distributions. It's very evident. And under this condition, we can show that, well, indeed, uh, if you can calculate the, the Euclid distance and you normalize by P, it's not a problem because we can always divide it by some constant. Uh, you will say that, well, it's for Xi from the class C A and Xj from the class C B, you get approximately the same answer in the sense that we have always this term which is indeed the randomness of our data so this term is of order of one and it appears in both cases in the case of uh, the two data from the same class class two and in the, in the case that the two data points are from the different uh, different class and in the sense that, so we know that we, we really say that the Euclidean distance is almost equal to some constant plus uh, some random, uh, so some small order, but informative team. In the sense that, indeed, uh, we have this this A and B that contain the statistical difference uh, uh, of our data, of our distribution. But it is even more surprisingly that, uh, in, in <coughs> fact. For p large enough, well, we have high probability that a is larger than b in the sense that, in fact, if you say two points from the distribution two, so class two, in fact, their distance, so a is larger than the distance uh, if you take two points from different class. So it's very amazing because uh, it's very different from 3D point of view because in this case we say that if you two take two points from class 2 and you measure their distance and this distance is even larger if you take two points uh, one from class 1 and one from class 2 so it's very amazing and very different from our three dimensional real world <coughs> and that equation uh, simply tells us that okay this distance is almost a constant and plus some very smaller terms uh, let us say some figures. So again, the idea is to cluster or classify uh, those n data points into t k class. So k here, I think in simulation, I will take two. We have only two class. And I build this so kernel <coughs> matrix, but it is indeed a similarity matrix. And how I build them, I just measure the distance between two data points. Okay? And I take a minus sign, I take the exponential. And that is the figure. So left, we say uh, this is typically what happens in low dimensional uh, in low dimensional problems. So if you have a five dimensional data vector, and you 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 build this similarity matrix, you see that it's indeed kind of a block structure. So here, let me explain. I take, uh, in fact, so the first half of the n data is from class one, and the second half is from class two. So in the first block, I'm comparing class one versus class one. So the distance is small according to our three-dimensional real world, and uh, the distance more takes an m with the minus sign, so it's going to be something large, something with large value. So it's wider here, okay? And the same thing for the diagonal term. And if we look at the off-diagonal block, we see that it's darker because. Uh, in the straight, uh, in the low dimensional case, so we have this this class one versus class two, or class two versus class one. So intuitively, this distance should be large. So with this minus sign, it should be small. Okay. So that's why we have off diagonal blocks that are darker because they have smaller value. So it's it works super fine, and we we see that okay, K have a kind of block structure. 
and it's supposed to have some kind of low rank behavior. And if we take out the uh, top eigenvector, we see that well, it's really like some plateau uh, that tells us okay, the first uh, one half of the data is from class one, and the second uh, one half is from class two. It's really nice behaved, and everything works fine. Okay, but for a high dimensional problem like when I take p equal to 250, it's not the case. And that is what happens. So it may not look really clear, but we see that we, we really do not have those block structures and everything is gray. Well, it's understandable because we have already proved or made the calculation that we have this value is almost equal to a constant, okay? So we are indeed taking the exponential of some constant so that explain why we have approximately the same value uh, in all the matrix. But even more surprising, if you still plot the top eigenvector, well, it works. And we, can't, we really do not understand why. But one thing for sure is that the behavior in low dimensional and high dimensional space should not be the same, but it indeed works. So we are trying to understand why. In fact, it is because even though the statistical difference is kind of super small, that hidden in those terms of smaller terms A, B, that are here, they are repeated everywhere in the large matrix. So that's, we have those kind of accumulated effect and makes it possible to jump out some outliers or spikes if you want uh, that are relevant in spectral norm. Okay? So uh, I write in, 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 in form of matrix and this is a simply a Taylor expansion because we say that uh, so the expression of, uh, of K uh, we have this, 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 this distance almost equal to some constant plus Okay, smaller terms, and we just do a Taylor expansion to break this exponential nonlinear function. And with this, we get the expression, or if you like, it's an approximation for a large dimensional uh, matrix K. And we see that, well, it has some uh, constant terms. So it's 1, 1 transpose, means that it's something repeated everywhere in the, uh, in the matrix that explains indeed why we observe those gray matrix in a high dimensional problem. And we have this uh, 1 over p x transpose e, which is indeed a machine cobalt score distribution. And we have this j transpose, jj transpose, with j is indeed the, the class information vector, which is indeed the plateau, in fact, that we are looking for. So the idea is that from op operator norm point of view, if this statistical difference is super is large enough, we will expect to have a spike or outlier or isolated eigenvector to drop out that tells us uh, uh, the, the, the the class information term in the sense that those top eigenvectors should kind of line to this J vector. That's what we are looking for. And indeed, that's why it works even for high dimensional data. Uh, briefly, so entry widely, we will say that okay, we have this expression, we have some uh, constant term plus random noise plus information teams uh, terms, and this information is super small, entry widely, but not spectrally. And we say that spectrum wise, we we have machine cobalt tour, which is of order one, and we have also this informative team term that are repeated everywhere is a low rank structure, so it's also of order one. So that's why we really say, observe that uh, it works for large dimensional data. And I'm going to move forward. So we have talking about kernel spectrum clustering. And uh, indeed, we observe kinds of the same thing for random neural networks. So maybe Luca this afternoon is going to tell us some more details, but uh, let us say what happens already for neural network and different. So neural network, we have some input X, we have some weight, so called weight matrix W, and uh, uh, after this matrix multiplication, we add some entry-wise nonlinearity to this matrix H1. Uh, for example, we typically use the so-called ReLU function or the sigmoid function. So that's why I'm talking about we uh, in neural networks, we're naturally involved 
those kind of entry-wise nonlinearity, and it's not really easy to handle uh, this stuff. Uh, and we continue to do the same thing. We multiply by some matrix W, and we apply entry-wise nonlinearity. And we get an output of the, the neural network. This is indeed what's different here. Okay. Uh, uh, but uh, I'm going to talk about very, very, very simple case in the sense that I have only two layer or three layer if you want. So I have some W. I'm going to apply some entry-wise nonlinearity sigma here. And I have another uh, beta that tells me the output of my network. Okay. And even more, I'm going to take the W, the first layer, to be random. Okay, that's all the, my limit and what I have, I can do. And uh, I want to, okay, just for information, uh, when you t take this W random and you uh, apply some entry-wise nonlinearity, you form this large sigma matrix. Indeed, they uh, correspond to something called random feature in, in machine learning coming. Okay, so it, it exists and it, and we want to understand uh, what what kind of feature it indeed extracts from the data X. Okay. So we are going to start these so-called random features. Mm, and for random W and NP large and large, uh, we can say that this grand matrix, or if you like this sample currency matrix again, is really related to this the following expectation. So I'm calling again this K uh, because it's indeed some kind of kernel that's, or if you like, some kind of similarity <laughs> matrix that measures the difference of the relation between data points. We'll say later in the next slide. So it's not hard to understand why we take the expectation with respect to W because uh, for a large random matrix W, we would like to, and uh, with IID entries, of course, we would love to compute this expectation. And uh, indeed, in the case of Gaussian, we can do this, uh, we can compute for not all, but some very commonly used nonlinearity, this, uh, this, uh, this expression or this expectation. Uh, we use some integral tricks. Uh, well, indeed, we use the fact that when you're a Gaussian, you can rotate your Gaussian, high dimensional Gaussian distribution, and it remains to be Gaussian. We use this fact, and we have this super long table that tells us, well, for different nonlinearity that people use every day, we can compute the expression of the expectation or the expression of the similarity matrix. So that's why I called it again a similarity matrix because indeed it measures the norm of our data point. For example, the norm of xi and xj, and also the angle between them and some kind of very complicated nonlinear function of these angles. Okay, so it's really kind of doing uh, the, the similarity matrix or similar, computing the similarity between our data. But again, this remains kind of com very difficult to understand this K matrix because it involves many, okay, the angle and uh, those nonlinear functions of them. So it's still hard to understand what it's doing. And what we are doing is, uh, what we're going to do is the same thing that we have done for, uh, for understand kernel spectrum clustering. So we're going to again to do a Taylor experiment. Uh, we're going to work again with Gaussian matrix models. So we have some, uh, this time again, we have some information in means and co information covariance, which is kind of more general because we take really some really covariance here, but not really equal to identity plus something. Okay? Uh, and again, we are going to work with this so-called non-trivial classification. We ask this, this difference, statistical difference to be sufficiently large. Uh, and uh, we can do t uh, do this computing, which is just like the expansion of our trading distance. And then x extra, this is the calculation I'm going to skip, it's not super important, but we see that, so this norm is going to concentrate around some constant, and we depend on c, and uh, apply some smaller terms, which helps us to do, to do, uh, to do a Taylor expansion, okay? And we have this first result that tells us the matrix K that we are interested in, which is again similarity matrix, is assemblically close to some K tilde that contains the randomness. So this Z that are just randomness from data, and also we have this phi and M, which are indeed the information it means in each class, and those T and S, 
are indeed the difference in traces of the coherence matrix and the difference, uh, I would say, in shape of the coherence matrix. Okay? So we have those statistical information uh, appears in, in this q tilde matrix that is essentially close to K. So we say that's okay, indeed we observe some, uh, some statistical information of the data and the most importantly that we say this J term it's indeed the J that we are looking for, that J that contains this, this, the class information or class structure, that's the plateau we have already seen, it's just uh, the, those, those it's class information that we, we are looking for, okay, so we are rather happy. So again, if we have enough statistical difference, we will say that the first top eigenvector is going to look like those plateau. But a very surprising again is that all this non-linearity that I have listed in the last table, their contribution to this, uh, this result breaks down into three coefficients. We have d0, d1, and d2. So for the only difference for this nonlinearity is that they have different value for d0, d1, and d2. So I listed the table of this. Okay, d0 is not really important because it will shift all the eigenvalues. And uh, so what really matters is d1 and d2. And very, very interesting that we say, okay, in this table for different nonlinearities, we sometimes have zero for d1 and sometimes have zero for d2, which means that if you have d2 equal to zero, you have zero multiplied by this b term that contains the statistical information of the coherence. So you have, if you have d2 equal to zero, you just essentially you just do not say those difference in your covariance of your data. And the same thing, if you have d1 equal to zero, you just kill or just forget your, uh, your statistical information in your means because you do not have this m term. So, this is this leads to a very natural classification of our nonlinearity. Uh, I plot again the table here. So we have those so-called mean-oriented, which preserves the information in means, but we have d2 equal to zero in the sense that we we just throw away the information coherence, and we have those coherence-oriented, we throw away those in means, but we enhance those incoherence, and we have those so-called balance with D1 and D2 different from zero. In the sense that we just make of both, make use of both statistics. We have, uh, we have preserved those in means and also those in covariance with a different factor, for example. That perhaps explains somehow why it's really popular to use a ReLU function uh, in real machine learning problems because it indeed, uh, when you take random networks, you preserve all statistics at the very beginning if you do not do gradient descent, of course. Um, yes, that's what I want to say. So and sigmoid. Sigmoid, sigmoid uh, typically is the error function that I have listed here, so it's yeah. indeed a mean oriented function. Yeah. Uh, so, here for some simulations, uh, we have four class. So. Uh, they are, so the class one and class two have the same mean but different covariance, okay? And uh, class three and class four, they have different mean compared to class one and class two, okay? So we will now apply our argument, apply different nonlinear to say what happens. Linear math, which is a mean or any function. So we see that, okay, so the second eigenvector is really contain only noise and not informative. If we took a little look at the first one, it tells us that, okay, the, the, the first class, uh, the class one and class two, two, it thinks that it's the same class because it's at the same level, okay? Uh, because that why is very easy, because they do not say the difference in covariance. Uh, for example, for him, class one and class two, they have same mean, so they're the same class. Uh, and they are dis different from class three and class two. They have the same covariance, uh, same mean that are equal to mu two. Okay, so with uh, mean oriented uh, nonlinearity, we do not say the difference in covariance. And with a covariance oriented, for example, the absolute function here, we observe that okay, class one and class three are it thinks it's the same class. Why? Because 
class one and class two, uh, class three share the same covariance that are different from those of class two and class four. Okay, so it thinks that okay again we do we really do not have we really do have only two classes because the second eigenvector is contains only noise <laughs> nothing. But if you we use some more more clever choice, we take the so-called root function. We see that the first eigenvector it tells that there are difference in means, and the second tells us that there are difference in covariance. So if we put the, the second, the, the top two eigenvector together, we see that well, it's going to be four class that's that really uh, well separated. So it's very interesting. Uh, and uh, I have played with Gaussian data. Let us say what happens in real world. Okay, L what what can we do? Can we uh, will our argument remain to be true for real data? The answer is yes. So I take the example of Annie's data set, which is just handwritten digits, and some EEG data. So I do some uh, empirical estimation, and we say that here for Annie's data, it has a larger information in means than those in covariance. Well, for EEG data, it has little information in means, but much rich information in covariance, which is kind of understandable because EEG data is kind of centered in zero, okay? And in this case, we're supposed to say that, okay, so those mean-oriented nonlinearity should work much better for Annie's data, while those covariance-oriented nonlinearity should work much better for EEG data. That's what happens in practice. So this is for Annie's, we see that this mean-oriented works much better than those covariance-oriented, which are about zero or five, okay? Can do nothing. And in the, sense, in the case of EEG time series, we see that those mean oriented works not really well, but this covariance oriented can do about 100% accuracy. This is very amazing. And in both cases, RU is not, it's a safe, but it's not, it's not always the optimal solution. That's, that is what happens for real data. And uh, from zero to practice. So uh, maybe you 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 you, you will say you, you just take two data set work, that works for your theory. Okay, uh, I can't cannot test every data set, but there's some kind of more deeper theory to <coughs> support our argument. Uh, random matrix usually assume that your data your data are kind of affine maps from some uh, rand uh, IID random vectors. Okay. Uh, Indeed, what I have been talking about remains to be true for those so-called concentrated random vectors. Okay, this math formula is kind of long, but uh, there are very interesting intuition behind. So what are those kind of concentrated random vectors? Uh, if you have a large dimensional vector in RP, so they are random, but you do a observation, you do a physical world observation, in the sense that I take some function f that maps to RP to R. So you observe these random vectors to a one-dimensional uh, object, and if you map after this mapping, this random variable f1x or f2x remain have some uh, concentrating effect. So if our distribution satisfy this property, all I said remains to be true. Okay, we have those nice properties uh, uh, from uh, random matrix theory remains to be true on these kind of vectors. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so what? You have introduced another definition, but uh, uh, what happens in practice? Well, in fact, this so-called concentrated random vectors really exist in practice. That is the output of those so-called GAN networks. Okay, what are GAN? They are the so-called generative adversarial networks. Okay, so it's... Um, Indeed, it's a kind of fake images that's generated by your neural network. So if you input some uh, random vectors, Gaussian random vectors, you pass through the, your neural network. Uh, so we have those, again, weight matrix and uh, uh, entry-wise nonlinearity. If you pass through your network, output, you get some concentrated random vector because it is indeed the Lipschitz map of some concentrated random vector, of some Gaussian random vector. And I would say it is really close to practice because today, with uh, the, the, the development of technology, those image generated, those fake images generated by these so-called GANs are really, really 
close to practice that human beings cannot distinguish them. So these are fake images generated by the procedure I just mentioned. So these are really uh, concentrated random vectors, but it's really for human beings, at least for me, to distinguish those from the real, real images. Okay, that may be used as an argument that is important to study the so-called random, uh, concentrated random vectors. And summary, so takeaway message. Uh, we say that we have also called loose, uh, those, this, this kind of curse of dimensionality effect, or the, the idea of okay, distance didn't make sense for large dimensional data. And uh, we use this Tyler expansion to understand this nonlinear uh, behavior that arises in, uh, in kernel spectrum clustering and also in uh, simple random neural networks. But we need a more advanced tool to handle more complicated things. For example, if, if we it is not possible to do Taylor expansion. And we can go beyond Gaussian or EED random vectors uh, if we are playing with concentrated random vectors. And, uh, but we, we often have even more questions. For example, what can we do if it is not possible to do Taylor expansion? Uh, do we have the so-called universality? What are the influence of higher order moments? Because I just play with Gaussian and we have only the, the first and second order moments if you want. And uh, what about deep neural networks? I haven't mentioned about uh, implicit solutions. So what are your, the object you're looking for is just a solution of an optimization problem. And there are much, much more to be done, okay? Uh, gradient descent dynamics, I think uh, uh, Andrew is going to talk about this afternoon. And uh, we have convex and non-convex optimization problem that are going to be much harder than what I have been talking about. And we have those even more more ideas that work in practice, but we really do not, do not understand why it works, and we really need experts in math and in random matrix theory to help us to, to solve those problems. And uh, those are some references, and thank you very much. And you can read our website if you have more information, if you need more information. Thanks. Okay, we have time for questions. Yeah. Uh, for the table of your uh, coefficients with uh, nonlinear activation functions, yeah. uh, at the first glance, it looks as if you can divide them into two classes. Yeah. Whether the new uh, the activation function is symmetric or anti-symmetric. Yes. Around the, the mean value, right? Yeah. Can yes. you have an intuitive understanding of this fact? Uh, what do you mean by understanding? I mean, why why does it happen? Why does uh, it happen that d1 okay. and d2 are basically determined by the symmetry of this function? Uh, I, until now, I do not really have a clear answer. But something we can say that, okay, up, after that, it really depends on the structure of your problem. But uh, indeed, but indeed, if you have, for example, a, a non-symmetric uh, nonlinear function, it will create a uh, in fact, a, a eigenvector that uh, eigenvalue that is super away from. In fact, it's of order of n. And after that, indeed, what we have trying to do, we are trying to do, in fact, is kind of prove. Uh, okay, the fact is that I just computed the expression of k that are listed here. So this is something that we have not yet managed to prove in the sense that we are not sure it works for more general functions because we just can compute the expectation for this. And we now we kind of managed to, we are trying, but not yet uh, arrived to do that, but we're trying to prove that, in fact, as long as your function can be expand, uh, expanding polynomials, in fact, you can, it depends on the coefficients of your polynomials. And uh, if you have, for example, uh, in, 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 indeed, if you're, for example, you have some nonlinear function sigma t, and in the sense that, if you have t follows a classical Gaussian distribution, uh, sometimes you can expand this function into the series of uh, uh, admit uh, polynomials. And it depends on the first several coefficients uh, of your polynomial that it's going to be mean oriented or covariance oriented. But it's not yet finished. But uh, perhaps that's, what, that's really explains why. And indeed, uh, uh, that is kind of related to the problem of symmetric or non-symmetric, because uh, the first uh, uh, 
the term of uh, Hamid polynomial is x, and then is x minus x power 2 minus 1, for example, is very close to that, I think. Yeah. Um, so, do you think also that your results could be, I mean, from the first part where you studied the um, RDF kernel, could be applied to uh, um, analyzing support vector machine learning and things like that? Yeah, we have tried to do some. Um, so, okay. Uh, I had, so this work presents one way to treat those uh, non-linearities. Uh, that's what I'm doing with Taylor expansion, in fact. But we are, we, we, we are really wondering if it is a good way to do that or not. Because if you are doing Taylor expansion, you indeed use your non-linearity around one point. Yes. You're not using indeed your, all your non-linearity function, you just use it around one point. That's my question, one. essentially. Yeah. So what, what remains of, you know, people say an RBF kernel has sort of an infinite dimensional yeah. feature space. And if you do Taylor expand, you say, oh, well, I don't care much about yeah, that. That's Possibly a quadratic kernel is sufficient for, for doing most of the work in high dimensions. Exactly. Yeah, okay. so that's, that's my question. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Indeed, I do not have an answer, but it remains. Okay. So, as far as I understand, Taylor expansion is kind of the only way I, understand, I manage to handle this non-linearities. And uh, after that, we have the so-called polynomial expansions, but it's much more involved than simple Taylor expansions. But from a technical point of view, anyway, I, I do Taylor expansion now, but indeed, I don't think it's a good thing to do, because I guess for behind those support vector machines, it should be something even behind that do not really align on a single point of your normal. Uh, I think it's better to continue to work and uh, we don't know what happens. So what happens when there are many, many classes? Uh, it depends. Your number of class remains the whole one constant as your NP grow large or it grows with NP. So typically for Amnes data or for, I don't know, CIFAR 10 data, you have 10 classes, so we can consider it to be a constant. But after that, it depends really on the nature of the data. Okay. okay. Thank you very much again. Thanks. I think we have a coffee break.